make yourself comfortable folks, in this video I'm taking you to the far east of Bhutan to a place that very few travelers get to experience and traversing the whole country from east to west taking you to some beautiful cultural experiences whilst testing out the new Leica M10P. One thing you should know about Bhutan, there's a lot of dogs so sometimes when you try and film they'll just go nuts and here we are. Welcome to a new series where we take tech on the road, explore a travel destination, and test the gear out in real life. This is Field Tested. The Kingdom of Bhutan is a landlocked country between India and China. It has only 700,000 people and it's officially Buddhist. The majority of people are still living a subsistence life in the numerous valleys that span the country. In this video I'm testing out the Leica M10P. This has just been announced, it's the P variant on the already wildly successful M10. And unlike some of the previous P variants, this actually brings in some significant new advancements over the previous model. The two main changes are it brings touchscreen functionality to the camera, and it now has the quietest shutter of any Leica M to date. It's really very quiet. The M10P itself is gorgeous. The one I loaned is all in matte black. I got it with the Vizio Flex viewfinder. You need that for the ultra wide angle lenses. Then I have a huge arsenal of lenses. First off, the 75 F2, then the 24 F1.4, then the legendary 50 millimeter F2 APO Summicron. This is an astonishing lens and this is actually an extra special edition with the brass rim on the top. Next, a 10 mm f5.6 rectilinear lens from Voigtlander. That's 10 mm full frame, not a fisheye. Then a quirky 16, 18, and 21 mm zoom f4 from Leica. You can only hit those three points in the range. Next up, the 35 f14 Summerlux. And finally, the 135 f3.4 APO Tellet. Now this video is brought to you by Capture One Pro and Lens Pro to Go. All the images you're seeing in this episode have been edited in Capture One Pro. Check out the link and coupon in the description and get 10% off your purchase. And I get all my rentals in North America from Lens Pro to Go. Check them out, they're great people to deal with and it's a great way to see if something will suit you before you spring out and buy it. Check out the links in the description below for 15% off your next rental. To start off our trip, we were flying from Paro, one of the two widest valleys in the country and the one where the international airport is, to the very far east near Tashigang. This is a newly opened airport. The flights don't go too often and it's weather dependent. The runway of the airport we were landing at was cut into the mountaintop and it's very short. It's actually angled upwards so then they're able to land in a short amount of distance and angled down so when they take off there's a sheer drop off but they're able to take off in less distance than you'd normally need. Now the reason we've come to the Far East on this trip is to visit Merak. Merak is a nomadic yak herding community central base where hundreds of families live but then go out regularly to take their yaks through the mountains. Now yaks can only really live at very high altitude and Merak is situated at 4,100 meters. The road to get there has only just opened up for cards. It's still very bumpy, but with our reliable four wheel drives, we were able to make it up.
Visiting Morak was really special. Culturally and ethnically, the people are a little different from the rest of Bhutan and it's much more isolated from the rest of the country and world than the other bigger cities. As well as joining a family for lunch, we had time to explore and walk around the village, meeting the locals, being invited into their homes for a glass of traditional homemade alcohol, ara, meeting with the kids and just shooting as we pleased. <laughs> what can I say? Yaks are pretty much just really big cats. Next up, we were driving west to Monga. Now, a couple of years ago, I stopped in at a small temple outside Monga and met this great young monk who I later found out his name was Sharab. So now, two or three years later, we called in again to see him and it turns out his mother had taken him out of the temple to go to the primary school nearby to get a general education. Long story short, we went to each of the different public schools trying to find him. Whilst at the second school, I met this fierce young lady who was not giving me an inch when I went to take her portrait, but she softened somewhat when I went and showed her the photo. We've come to the regional boarding school where hopefully Sharab is and hopefully can meet him again and say hi and maybe have a little surprise. The first school didn't know where he was but knew his mum. The second school were in the middle of sports when we arrived and were really intrigued by us. He also didn't go there but one of the kids said he knew him and that he was his neighbour so he could guide us to him. So to our surprise the teacher said it's almost the end of the day he can just leave with you so we took him and his friend on a drive through town, got to the home and Sherab wasn't actually there but his mum was so we got to meet her and she went with us to the third school to go pick him up where actually he had left for the day. But long story short, we did eventually all get to meet up. Turns out his mum has moved from her home to the city to be with Sharab so he can have his education and she's weaving to try and cover the costs. I feel really lucky to have this opportunity. I bought all of her weaving as a gesture to help with their expenses and I've actually decided to sponsor Sharab's education and I'll be sending them money regularly to cover the costs of them living in the city and the costs of him going to school. Here are some of the other monks we found at the temple when we first looked for Sharab. I saw this kid as I walked down the hill, I instantly recognised him. He's also in the shot that I have from four years ago. Next up, one of the cornerstones of our journey to Bhutan is visiting a traditional local festival. Now, this is a festival that doesn't get other tourists. We've brokered access to it over years of going there myself. It's high among the rice paddies and it's a phenomenal festival that's a mix of Buddhist and animist religious beliefs that they hold every year for generations to bring good luck for the harvest. It's singing and dancing and drinking and all kinds of festivities and playing darts to celebrate as a community and get ready before the harvest. One of the traditions is to take puffed rice and actually basically exfoliate each other's skin. You rub it up and down on their cheeks or forehead and then throw it in the air and it's a sign of good luck and kind of a cleansing for this special time of year. The dancing provides great opportunities to slightly slow down your shutter speed and get a bit of movement. The trick is then to time it so you get the outfit moving but the face or mask still sharp. These were taken in the vicinity of a 30th to an eighth of a second. 
Okay, folks, so the festival was amazing fun. That's the third or fourth time that I'm going there. Great to see the same families again. It's such a celebration. The whole community gets together and they're basically doing a bunch of rituals for a successful harvest. So there's lots of alcohol being passed around, of course, the dancers, and they're raising money for the temple at the same time. Loads of fun. Now, I have to say, I've been loving shooting with the M10P. Of all the Leicas that I've ever shot with, this is the first one that is actually making me think this could be something that I want on a long-term basis. I love the interface, and uh, as long as you nail focus with a little bit of cropping, I really love the results that it's giving. And in Bhutan, a country where generally things are moving slower and people aren't in a rush, and you can take that extra quarter of a second to five seconds that it takes to absolutely nail focus or they get a couple of extra shots to make sure you get it in focus, it's working great. But at the festival with so much movement, I have to say, I did struggle and, you know, of course I have to acknowledge that that's as much to do with my manual focusing skills as it is a camera. It just is a manual focus camera. So having the option of the rangefinder and the EVF is much better for me, but still I absolutely did miss shots at the festival that I would have gotten if I were just shooting with my DSLRs. After the festival, our group headed back to the headman's home for a traditional ceremony of more drinking, more food, and the locals dancing, which of course we got involved with. Now this is ridiculous. This is too pretty. Whilst I have a chorus, do check out Capture One Pro 11. All of the images that I have shown in this episode have been edited in that. I'm really getting to like it. It's much faster than what I was using in the past and the output speaks for itself. Okay, back in studio now with my editing manager, Loki. I've got a bunch of images here to go through and edit to put into the video for you guys, but I thought I would bring you along to show you a couple of the features of Capture One Pro on a couple of shots. So there's so many, but I think these two are a good cross section. So this first one taken in the temple, this was not the 10 mil, it's actually the 16, 18, 21 at 16 mil. I really wanted this to just be kind of an abstract shot of lines, but you can see I wasn't perfectly centered and it's a bit skewed. So if I go into lens here and then just adjust my keystone, Boom, I pretty much get that top level, which for me is the more important one. Jump into cropping and I'm going to do it unconstrained so I can crop it exactly as I want. Something like that works. Now a really powerful tool this has is the HDR sliders for highlight and shadow. So if we wanted to bring back more detail from the sky, boom, there it is. If we wanted to bring more from the shadows, boom, there it is, and there's my other tour participants. I actually wanna drop the exposure slightly and really darken down those shadows. And I just realized I have done the crop a little bit off. I wanna make sure I get some of the bottom there. That'll pretty much do it, simple. And this other one, I want to, first of all, crop it in. I'm gonna make this a four by five. Not every shot looks best as a six by four, in my opinion. I want to not crop off his hair or the bottom of the go and get it fairly symmetrical. So this is getting pretty close to what I want. I might just bring it in a little on this side. That works. Now, in terms of, basically I wanna bring out more detail in his face. This was shot with a 75 mil F2. Background's nice and soft. I can play with the clarity and structure and it's not gonna mess up my background too much. They have four variables for the clarity. Natural looks fairly subtle. Classic I find works really well for portraits and doesn't overdo it and I find especially it doesn't mess up the backgrounds. If you are using something, say a shot of a building where really going gritty won't make it look unnatural, then the punch adds a whole lot of detail there. But for people, for me, that's generally too much. But here, the classic, I think, looks nice. So let's take a look at those two shots before and after. 
If you want to pick up a copy of Capture One Pro, jump to the link that's in the description below. Use the code MATTG at checkout and you'll get 10% off. Being that Bhutan is a series of mountains and valleys, the climate varies quite a bit by altitude. So whilst the previous community was getting ready for their harvest, other areas had already completed their harvest. So we did get some opportunities to shoot as the women were trying to get the husks off their wheat. Throughout Bhutan, you see people traditionally drying their vegetables to preserve them. And chilies are a national dish. One risk though of leaving them out is that even the birds in Bhutan love their chilies. In terms of lenses, I think I overpacked. Let me just run you through them. The 50 is phenomenal. If your budget extends to it and you're a Leica M shooter, it's simply the best you can buy. But at that price, it's only going to be a really select handful of even Leica shooters who can justify it. I really love using the 10 mil Voigtlander and it's reasonably cheap in this bunch anyway, under a thousand dollars. So creative what you can make with it. 16, 18, 21, I really enjoyed shooting with as well. 16 is plenty wide and I found I use that a lot more than the 24. It comes down to shooting style, right? 35 was fantastic, easy to shoot with. For whatever reason, I found those wider angles, 50 and below, the easiest to nail focus manually. Whereas when I'm using my Nikons and say using my Zeiss Otis's, I find the 85 is quite easy. But in this instance, I found the 75 and 135 actually a little bit difficult. All of them are optically good. The 50 is out of this world. The 135 is probably the weakest of the bunch, but still really, really great. Just if I was only gonna bring three or four, it'd be the 50, the 10, the 16, 18, 21, and the 35. Whilst in Bumtang, we visited a temple that was home to hundreds of monks that were there on a pilgrimage and we arranged a special prayer ceremony where we, as the only guests, were allowed to take photographs. This is the third or fourth time we're coming here. We make a donation to the temple and it's fantastic to be able to shoot like this. Generally, anywhere where you need to take your shoes off inside the special temples, photography is not allowed. And I have to say, here's where the quiet shutter of the camera really shone. I had used it in Hong Kong and other places and I was able to get just a few feet away and people wouldn't even hear the click of the shutter. But here in a relatively quiet room, being able to get quiet shots and take some interesting long exposures was really great. Inside the prayer ceremony was incredibly dark, so a good chance to test the high ISO performance. Here at 6400 and going in at 100%, I think that's definitely usable. Jumping up to 20,000 for a lot of uses, that'd be fine, but it's higher than I'd like to be. But then as we go up to 32,000 and 50,000, I really don't think it's usable for much. Okay folks, end of a two week trip, regrettably winding up now. We're shooting our last sunset at the biggest seated Buddha in the world, well officially once it gets consecrated. I've really enjoyed shooting with the Leica M10P. I have to say I think you, you have to come back to the fact that Leicas are their own special beast. Shooting with it, I kind of forgot that it's so expensive to be frank. It's I really enjoyed using it. The interface is great. The battery life is great. I love the images I'm getting from it and I'm able to get a whole lot of detail from it in Capture One Pro. You know, it is a lower res than my other camera, the D850, but for most applications, it's going to be heaps. Now, I think if you're a Leica user, that none of that needs any kind of justification. And in that sense, I think this is pretty much the ultimate Leica M camera that I've ever tested. If you're in the digital realm, this is so refined, it's got additional tech added to it, which makes the shooting experience a lot easier, but it still has that uh, total M feeling to it. If you're not a Leica shooter, it's still a big pill to swallow to say it's $7,000 for the body, full manual focus, and then you've got the glass on top and you could easily get yourself to $20,000 with a one body, three or four lens kit. There are cheaper options out there and I've really enjoyed using this 10 millimeter F5.6 from Voigtlander. I would say to anyone, if you are in the Leica M system, to check this lens out. 10 mil is so creative and fun. For those of you who are 
tossing it up and thinking about it, then do please check out Lens Pro to go and see the different cameras they have available there. It's a great way to try out gear before you buy anything, plan a big weekend or a week of shooting, rent in the gear, test it out for yourself in the way that you like to use it, and see if it's actually gonna work for you before you drop all of that money on it. I think this is the most accessible Leica M to date. With the touchscreen, the way it all integrates together, it's just a really sound package. I said this to a friend of mine who has the Leica M10. It just feels like almost the perfect blend of the tradition and the modern together, and it doesn't feel like they're kind of competing with each other. So I've really enjoyed shooting with it. Would I add it to my kit? I would love to have it in my kit, but considering the price, it's a little bit difficult for someone like me to justify it. But if you have the cash, you, it suits your shooting style to be a little bit slower, a little bit more meticulous with things, then I think you're absolutely going to love it. Let's jump in with a little time lapse over Buddha, and then we'll close this out. I shot this montage with the D850 using its silent intervalometer. Great time in Bataan, hope you enjoyed that. Let's close this out with a cute furry friends montage. Best friends, best friends. Look at them, they squeak. <laughs> <laughs>